All right. Welcome, everyone, to another episode of The Jake Dunlap Show. We are very excited that you joined us. If you haven't tuned in, this is the show where we talk to celebrities, thought, and industry leaders to really discover their journey to success. I am super excited that you're joining us. This show is like no other. I can promise you that. You might laugh. You might cry, but you will definitely leave inspired and gain a whole new level of insight into those people that you follow, love, and admire. All right. Welcome, everyone, to another episode of The Jake Dunlap Show. Uh, as usual, like this one's going to be fun because I I enjoy the art and science of most things, right? And and obviously, I built a long career in sales, and people think it's this like dark art of like, oh, I do these things. And the reality is there's so much science and so much neuroscience and uh, psychology that goes into it that I, it really satisfies both sides of my brain. So I'm really excited about today. And so I want all of you to imagine a world where you could light the Olympic rings with your mind. You could pour a beer that could be dangerous. Well, it depends like what would happen <laughs> later after you've had like seven, you know, through thought controlled beer tap or paint a picture using your thoughts. This week's guest brings the world of art, science, fashion, and tech all together with her brain sensing headband technology. Her work has been featured in CNN, Forbes, Popular Science, TechCrunch, Wall Street Journal, HuffPo, and I'm sure there's like 9,000 others. So please join me in welcoming the Picasso of Brainways, Ariel Garten. Ariel, thank you for joining me. Ah, uh, thank you. It's my joy and pleasure to be here. Yeah, I'm excited for the conversation. Like as we were going through the prep, prep uh, internally for this, there's some really cool things that popped up. So I'm I'm pumped about this. So as everyone knows, you know we we focus on telling the journey of uh, the successful people that you see today, celebrities, executives, entrepreneurs, uh, CEOs, uh, and really the stories that that really shape the people that they are today. And so as usual, we're going to go back in time. So we're going to go back, you know, with the <laughs> exactly. In the way back like machine. A whole, yeah. Like a wave. There's some waves <laughs> that are happening right now. Like the so, Doctor Who up, that always scared me as a kid. Uh, well, dude, well, that was. Just, I think Doctor Who scared you as a kid because like they're the creepiest like villains. Like and there was the, there was the music too. Woo, woo. Yeah, it was the music. Yeah, the music was and then the thing is spinning. My mm -hmm. mom was really into Doctor Who too. So because of that, if you were if you were born in that like. I guess like 80, I like this is the 80s that I saw this, but I think that it started before, way before that. I think actually, you know, fun stat, I think Doctor Who, I, I think I remember this from trivia. I think Doctor Who actually has, I think maybe the Simpsons or somebody else beat them, but Doctor Who did have the record for like most episodes. Like it was some ridiculous amount because it came back too. So it's like before and after. So a lot of people are like, what are they talking about right now? Like, what is, what is this? <laughs> you clearly, this? I... That is uh, so, so anybody who has no idea what we're talking about, this was a show in the late 70s, early 80s with a very creepy intro where they would like zip back in time and back and forth into different warp zones. And it was super creepy and obviously uh, shaped something in my consciousness <laughs> when I think about exactly, going back. Exactly. Back in time. You're just like, no, I don't want to go back in time. It's, it looks, it's really bad there. So, so we're going to go back in time for you. And that's Toronto. So uh, I think it's always, I always love talking to people who kind of like, born and raised in the same place. I talked to a lot of people who have moved all over. Um, but, you know, you're born in Toronto. This is in, you know, kind of raised in like, you know, the 80s in Toronto, which I have to imagine is a much, I was just in Toronto. I guess, gosh, it's been like three years since Toronto kind of stayed in lockdown for so long. Um, but, you know, what was what was life like growing up in Toronto during that time? What are some of the things that really stand out to you? I know you had a lot of, you know, um, really amazing influences in your, your mom and your, you know, her love of art, et cetera. So what was life like for you growing up in the early years? Sure. And, you know, Toronto is, at that point was nowhere near what it is now. Now it's an incredible cosmopolitan multicultural city with endless art events and experiences that you can have. Back then, Toronto, not so much, but I, I managed to still experience that within my own world. My mom, as you mentioned, was an artist, so she would make these amazing large-scale oil-on-canvas paintings. On days when I stayed homesick from school, she would paint me, and, you know, weekends I would just sit on the stairs to her studio just watching her paint. And it was this incredible experience of seeing a completely blank canvas and her having some idea in her head which she could then render in front of her in beautiful colors that created this like really emotional experience for the viewer. And so from her, I really learned that kind of anything is possible and you can imagine something and make it happen. 
and I was lucky enough to be surrounded by her artist friends and community um, and also a very early tech community. So one of her friends was a guy by the name of Vincent John Vincent, who in 1985 would come to our living room and dance and talk to us about computers. And he was the guy who founded a company called Gesture Tech that actually created all of the patents around uh, the ability to have a virtual augmented society, uh, experience where by moving your hands, you could move what was going on in the scene. So like the, you know, Microsoft technology that came out of that, a lot of the early VR technology and AR technology, he was a pioneer. So, you know, I was Got lucky it. enough wow. to have to have these awesome influences around me um, at a time in my life when I thought that technology was terrible and like computers were anti-natural and like, you know, because we had a computer in my grade three class in 1985 and it was like this square Whoa. boxy thing that I hated using <laughs> and felt like so, so constrained and forced. Um, and so I think, you know, but you can play that... video games, right? Like that was like the, that was really like the only value I feel like whenever, whenever I saw my first computer. Um, that so unfortunately because it was in our classroom it was not for playing video games uh, it was for like painfully one finger typing your assignments that would always oh get God. lost in a database that you didn't understand how to navigate because you were eight years old and computers were pretty novel <laughs> that is wild. that's wild that they had i mean it's pretty crazy i mean that's that's early for having computers in the classroom i mean that's really early it really is so i went to a school that was very close to the university of toronto so uh, they basically were doing pilot programs at our school, bringing computers into the classroom very, very early on and seeing what the effects are. Um, but I think some of that early experience also informed my relationship to technology and my feeling that technology really has to be something that is natural and supports your user, human user experience rather than you know something n that fights against it. And so in the creation of Muse, we were really trying to build this seamless experience that supported you as a human rather than detracting from it or feeling anti-natural or taking your attention somewhere else away from the self. So so at this time, so you're getting this this crazy experience. Um, and I know, again, I, I, what age did this start? So one, one, one thing that I read was that you never wore anything twice to school. <laughs> like at what age? Like <laughs> that's, that's, what, that's what it says. I know you started like later on, you started yeah. really getting to fashion. But like at what point did you never wear the same thing twice to school? Um, I think that was possibly all of high school. So I was wow. super into, I was into the arts. I was into creating things and making things and dancing. And um, there was this amazing resource uh, not too far from my home called Goodwill, where people would donate their clothing <laughs> and you could go and stuff a bag and pay a dollar a pound for that clothing. And so I would go and, you know, buy like 70s moo moos and polyester pants and all sorts of weird things that nobody else wanted but me at that point and take them home and cut them up and re-sew them together and explore. And clothing became my sort of uh, pathway to expression to the world um, because it was every morning it was like, I am this canvas. I can put on something that's going to say something different, that's going to explore a different concept, that's going to be, you know, colorful and give you a different sort of feeling and uh that really became part of an important part of my expression fueled by this incredibly um cheap resource of endless right. garments that's for dollar one. bound yeah but that's that's pretty crazy especially if like you're gonna like customize the clothes and create your own that you're gonna only wear the but then that, that was like a thing then people are like wow like look she's like literally never wears the same outfit yeah, I don't think it was conscious that I was never trying to wear the same thing twice. I think it was just always this fun exploration. And of course, once you're buying clothing at that scale, it's like, you know, your room's only so big, your closet's only so big. So the entire floor of my room was just filled with clothing, like, you know, kind of like a foot or two deep at a certain point because you just keep accumulating it. Um, and then eventually giving it back and recycling it in this in this generous cycle. So it was really what easy to just... Fashion? Like, what was it that got you into fashion? You know, obviously there's like this artistic and you're getting this tech. Like, what, what was it about fashion for you? Um, it felt really natural and really easy. I mean, you have to get dressed every day. And so if you're going to, you know, do an experiment with something, it's like the most tangible way to do it. You know, painting is kind of hard because 
you do you try to paint a painting and if you don't have the talent to move your hand in this very finessed way the painting's going to look terrible and it's always going to be frustrating and it's never going to be what you wanted it to be um you know music is also good but requires a lot of training and i play the violin and sing and do all these things but clothing is just so unbelievably accessible um where you literally could you know make a new creation every morning go out in the world and then have real conversations around it, <laughs> you know, actually have real yeah. engagement in this art experience with someone. That's cool. That's cool. And then, and then at what point, again, you talked earlier and as we kind of like get into like high school, um, at what point did science, you know, did you really start to, I guess, kind of realize that that was also a passion? I think sometimes, sometimes it can be very, you know, polar. It's like, you know, it's kind of this way and this way, or maybe it's this way at work and then this way after work. But, you know, what was it about science that, you know, I know you, you know, had a job in research, um, you know, at a really young age. And so where did that, I guess, like thirst for knowledge or experience come from? So thirst for knowledge is a great way to put it. Um, I was really fascinated by how the world worked and really fascinated by why the world worked. It's like, you know, why is this table hard? Like, what, how are the molecules in there coming together to create a surface that I can put something on? I was really curious just about how the world came together. And in high school, I ended up being very good at science, um, probably just because I had a good, much better memory at that point in my life than I do now and could memorize all these scientific facts. Um, and a real curiosity and a desire to put all of the understanding of systems together and um, ultimately ended up in a research lab at the age of 17. Um, and it just happened to be down at Mount Sinai Hospital. Um, I started with a co-op position there and then stayed on longer. And it was in the lab of Dr. Alan Bernstein. And this is 1997, back when embryonic stem cells were like the coolest thing possible. And so I was uh, helping them doing embryonic stem cell research in knockout mice looking at the hemopoietic system, so the blood system of these mice, and saying, okay, well, if we knock out this gene and then grow uh, mice with this knockout, what happens, you know, what is missing, what is the impact of this gene? So by, by very, 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 very lucky chance, I, you know, got to work on embryonic stem cells and knockout mice at the age of 17, while at the same time having a clothing line that I started to sell to the stores in downtown Toronto. That's pretty ambitious. Where do you think, I mean, again, like you talked about your mom, I mean, maybe, maybe that's it. Like, where did you get this kind of, I don't know, like entrepreneurial, I mean, you call it entrepreneurial if you want, or more of just like, it, was it, was it again, like I said, this, the thirst for curi like being curious and just interested in different things, or where do you think that kind of, I guess also, you know, working and, you know, starting down those paths as well too? Yeah. So there's a few different strains there that play into this. So on the entrepreneurial side, um, my dad was an entrepreneur. My grandparents were entrepreneurs. Everybody was entrepreneurs. You know, my grandparents came to Toronto as refugees from World War II, um, Holocaust survivors who had to just make up their own jobs and figure it out. And, and you know, my dad grew up in that environment as well. Just you, you've only got what you make. <laughs> you've only got what you can do. Um, and so he, he was an entrepreneur. And you know, so I really had this vision that how you, what you do in life is what you want to do. You know, you don't just go and get a job for somebody from somebody else, because um, then you're giving all of your labor to somebody else and like their random idea, which may or may not yeah. serve you or serve the world in any way. So it's like if you want something, you got to go out and make it. You got to go out and do it. Um, and then I also had in me this really strong confidence that I think came from the supportive love of my mother. She really was an amazing mom who who instilled in me the sense of both unconditional love and my own skills and capabilities, even if I really wasn't that skilled or capable. <laughs> so right. I, had, I had this like just kind of actually extremely naive belief that I could kind of do anything. It's like, you know, you want to design some clothing and, and see if somebody wants to take it, give it a try. Sure, you can do that. Um, yeah, so, you know, I went to stores in downtown Toronto and I took my shirts to them and a bunch of stores said no. And one store said, yes, sure, we'll take those shirts on consignment. And I was like, great. And I had zero idea what consignment was at all. all right. <laughs> no idea what the business model should be. Nothing. Yeah, like, okay. I'm, are you paying me now? Is this like what's happening here? Like, yeah, but fine. Making the shirts. 
I'm going to see like all of a sudden somebody's validated that. So it's like, cool, I'm a designer. I can try that again with the next shirt. Um, so it was really this, this feeling that I could do whatever I set my mind to. And then if it didn't work out, it's like, that's okay. That's not personal. It's not like I invested my life's work in trying to do this, but you'll just sort of do it a different way and see if that works. Very, very plucky, very naive. And that naivety was super helpful. <laughs> Yeah, right. Exactly. That kind of like not fear of failure. And, you know, again, like even the things that you're doing are things that you enjoyed. Right. And I think, you know, if you're doing things you enjoy and you're learning along the way, then it's kind of what the journey is about. And so I think you're right. Like sometimes whenever parents and I've got two young kids too, seven and four. And, you know, I think about this all the time of like, you know, steering, but, but creating space, you know, and, and I think it's a tough balance as a parent, you know, sometimes to open yet guide at times, but then not guide and let them figure it out. But I think again, if the, if you know, if you find these things you're curious about, then I think it always makes it easier. Yeah. And it, it came naturally. And I also very much had instilled from my mother who was an artist where it's about, you know, creating something that's tangible, making something. I had this real drive to produce things and make things and, you know, have them be in the world to have an impact in that way. And, um, also the sensation, even at a young age, that I didn't want to be wasting time. Yeah. You know, time in which I was not doing or making or moving something forward was time that was kind of wasted. Um, oh, also, key, key, key point, my mom threw out the television when we were young. This is like an actually oh, wow. really important part of the story. Yes. Because yes. if I could have watched four hours of television a day, I wouldn't have done most of this crazy stuff. It was because I didn't have that you know, comfortable place to go, I had to just keep coming up with my own things to do. <laughs> Maybe that's it. I'm going to do that with the iPad. Like, you know, it's like the iPad is like the, you know, the, the 2000s version of this where it's yeah. like, it's so easy. You're just like, I have things to do. It's like, no, like they'll figure it out. He'll go read a book or something, you know, or he'll go maybe make his own clothes or go sell yeah. stuff on eBay. That's his latest thing is he'll find random things we're not using and try to sell them on eBay. So but hey, I encourage it. I'm like, great, go do it. Totally, making of entrepreneurship. And as a parent, it's so easy to be like when your kid wants your tablet and you're tired. It's like, fine, just do it because I'm too tired to figure out what to do with you. And you know, if you don't give them the tablet, then it's going to just come back on you to be like, but mommy, what am I exactly. doing now? Mommy, exactly. play with me. Mommy, spend time with me. Um, um, which is wonderful, but also not helpful when you're trying to work from home at a job and you just, just physically can't. And it's, it's uh, you know, as a parent, such a hard battle to say inside yourself, not to mention the of battle course. with the kid, to say, okay, we're going to not give them the tablet now and we're going to go through the pain of figuring out what else it That's is right. that they're going to do because they're too young That's to you know, deal with that pain themselves. That's exactly it. Trust me. And I know that during <laughs> COVID, a lot of people have experienced this. So, okay, so you've got all these things. You're doing all these things. You graduate and then you go to University of Toronto, uh, University College. And you pick, you made, you major in neuroscience, which is amazing. And, you know, tell me about like, what was that experience like for you? So you, you stayed, you know, kind of relatively close. Um, you then are kind of, I guess, thinking, okay, well, I'm going to go to college, you know, which maybe was a choice or not. You're kind of doing your thing. Um, like what was college like for you? And again, I'm just, I mean, cause again, it sounds like you're doing like a lot of like real work versus, you know, just going out and having fun. So college was incredibly fun. Um, I lived down the street from the University of Toronto, <laughs> so it was a pretty obvious place to go there. Um, my choice was between going to Ryerson, which had an incredible fashion design program, and the University of Toronto, which had an incredible science program. And so it's like, okay, well, let's let's see the science thing through first, because you can always go back and do fashion afterwards. So I enrolled in sciences, absolutely loved it, you know, just drinking and knowledge, loved being a university student, minored in philosophy, um, and really, really loved the university experience of being able to just spend time with ideas and think about things and learn things. Um, also, of course, had a awesome social life and great friends and, you know, going out to pubs and all of the things. And so, you know, it feels like I, I in some ways had a very ideal university experience. Um, and at the same time, by my second or third year, moved into an apartment where I kind of turned it into an art gallery. 
And at the same time, I had this other, you know, I kept going sort of on the clothing design business a little bit. And then as soon as I graduated with my neuroscience degree, I said, okay, well, I've done neuroscience for the last four years. Um, now it's time to see what's in this clothing thing for me. So the apartment that I was in was on the main street, like downtown main street, Toronto, because the university is right downtown. And so I basically like opened the door to my apartment, turned it into a little store. Is and that Flavor Hall? Is that, that was the, Flavor the, Hall. Yep. Yeah. Which we then later renovated and turned really into a store. And, um, and all of a sudden like hired a dressmaker because I should mention that although I was a fantastic designer of clothes i was a terrible constructor of clothes <laughs> so, that's a key so, element that's yeah a that is element. a key element um uh so you know patience has never been my strong suit as, as the story might suggest um so hired a dressmaker at that point the only way you could hire a dressmaker is putting an ad in the newspaper saying i would like to hire a dressmaker <laughs> and people call you on your telephone um mm -hmm. if they respond to your ad and uh, we together started to create a line of clothing, populated it in my store, um, started to sell to other stores across North America, got a rep in the uh, U.S. Midwest, um, started doing Toronto Fashion Week every season, every year rather. And uh, all of a sudden at the ripe old age of 22, 23, 24 was a fashion designer started to get into the newspapers because my things were going down the runway and there were people who were taking shots of it. So, you know, it really felt like I was on top of the world. Now, at the same time, I continued uh, working in some neuroscience labs. Um, yeah, that's what I thought. Yeah, you're still doing this, right? <laughs> like a year after, yeah. when I've got like timeline, you start this in 2002, but then in 2003, you're doing neuroscience research uh, yes. as well. Yep, so... Uh, being downtown in Toronto was very lucky because uh, my store was right next to the University of Toronto. The University of Toronto was then right next to the Toronto Western Hospital, which is one of the major neuroscience research hospitals. Um, they're literally like a four blocks away, three blocks away. And so I would leave the store with an intern in it um, and I would walk down the street to the research lab. <laughs> and uh you know do a little work there for a while and then by 2002 2003 that's when I started collaborating with Steve Mann um another University of Toronto professor and a guy who happened to be the inventor of the wearable computer so the this is a man who in 1998 was walking around with a pair of glasses with a camera connected oh to a computer. Oh my gosh I know exactly who he is yes yeah I remember yeah I remember him for sure it was the yes. original Google Glass, basically. Like they, exactly. they copied all this stuff off of it. Yeah, and he had like a huge comp yeah. Anyone we'll put a link to it in the show notes so people can go check him out on like Wikipedia. It's pretty totally. cool. Totally. It's incredibly cool. Like the real deal, real mad scientist, the guy who literally invented Google Glass twenty years before Google did. Yeah. Um back at MIT in the nineties. So a one of my good friends i was super social one of my good friends worked in his lab um he was his master student chris amini he was uh this incredible electrical engineer and we'd go out you know dancing and raving in the evenings and then he'd go back into the lab and i'd roll back into the lab with him um and uh at this point steve had a lab in his home and so we just you know hang out working on things and steve and i began to collaborate with this brainwave system that he had. So Steve had built this brain computer interface system at MIT in the 90s. And I, as a you know, neuroscience grad, um, was very fascinated with it and very fascinated by what we could do with it. And what we started doing was creating concerts where you could translate your brainwave activity into sound. Um, I was not a computer programmer, but luckily uh, Chris, um, who became my co-founder at Muse, it was an incredible electrical engineer and programmer. And so we took this early system and started to, he started to program it to create these experiences where based on shifts in your brain state, you could actually hear changes in the audio in the room. So you could hear as you focus, the audio could get louder, as you relax, the audio could get lower. And so we created these amazing experiences where people could come and come together and hear the sound of their own mind.
And so we we played around with this concept with a few other people who were in the lab, like James Fung. Um, and for a few years, it was just explorations. And I went back and kind of, you know, continued to collaborate with Steve in fun ways. But, you know, we made like things like shirts with your brainwaves on them. And I really started to weave together the my art and science lives. Right. Um, and, you know, I was sort of doing my own thing in fashion and it like sort of kept rolling in my head, like, what can we do with this? Um, by my third or fourth year in fashion, my dad's like, okay, you know, you've had a lot of fun with this, but this really is not a good business model. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So you're open yeah. and free. And then there's a point where dad's like, okay, look, let's just be real here about what's happening. Yeah, let's be real. And I mean, I was making money. I was like, I literally had a business where I was hiring people to create clothing. I was selling that clothing in my store. Um, I was having interns run the store because they couldn't afford to pay anybody. But um, they were, you know, I was teaching them. They were teaching me. It all, it all worked out. Yeah. Of um, and, and then um, I would sell these items to stores and they would pay me. But the stores never, ever, ever paid you on time, <laughs> ever. And then they'd reorder and then they'd never pay you for the reorders. And so my dad is like, this is fabulous, but this is really not a business model. You know, go and figure out something to do that's actually going to be a successful business. There is no economy of scale here. And, you know, I was paying my dressmakers X dollars an hour. And by the time you marked it up properly, you can't actually pay somebody a proper Canadian wage right. to make clothing and have it sold at a reasonable price. And so this was devastating to me because I'm now 24, 25, you know, I'm in, in fashion magazines and on the cover, you know, newspaper section covers as a designer and a designer who's a neuroscientist. And it's like, you know, this is the coolest thing I could think of. And my dad's right. like, nope, go find something else to do. And for some stupid, brilliant, I don't know why ever reason I listened to him. <laughs> I don't know why. Right. right. Um, um, maybe, yeah, I, I, I really don't know why I listened to him. And so I closed my store, which was like the most painful thing in the entire world. I then uh, went and um, got postgraduate training as a psychotherapist because I figured, okay, well, I, I want to somehow create a business. You know, what's what's the next business? It's the entrepreneur in you. And somehow that business was going to be around the brain. Um, and being a psychotherapist was a way to uh, sort of engage this question of the mind and the brain from a different direction. Um, so I opened my psychotherapy, went through all the training, opened my psychotherapy practice, continued through more and more and more training, um, and absolutely loved it and ended up spending actually a decade as a psychotherapist. And, and what was that like? I mean, like for people who don't know, you know, how is that different than, you know, what people might <laughs> typically, you know, think? Because whenever I, you know, when I was kind of doing the prep here, you know, a lot of it's like, like gaining clarity on objectives and needs and overcoming limiting beliefs. And, you know, as opposed to, I think a lot of people think when they hear therapist, it's like this, you know, you're laying on a couch. Maybe they were laying on a couch too, but I think it's maybe a little bit different. Like how, how like for people who don't know, how would you describe the differences um, so there are many different forms of psychotherapy. Um, you know, psychoanalytics is what you think of when you're lying on a couch, and that's a very long and painful process of pulling out all of your childhood experiences. Whereas the kind of psychotherapy that I would do was a little bit more pragmatic and based on um, helping people understand what's going on in their mind and body at the moment and identifying where the roots of their blocks, tensions, frustration, struggles are coming from. And that's not an exhaustive exercise at looking at everything you did when you were three years old. That is identifying, you know, what are your limiting beliefs, identifying where, why you, why you feel the way you do in this situation, and does this actually map to reality? So using techniques closer to things like cognitive behavioral therapy, where you're really analyzing, are my thoughts actually aligned to what's really going on? And if they're not where did those beliefs come from? And then how do we go about shifting and changing those beliefs to be more aligned with reality? Cool. All right. I think that'll be helpful for a lot of people because again, like the type of work and then, and then you're doing that and then you do start Muse. 
right and we'll again we'll link to we'll do all the links so people can you know check it out and um you know, i think it's 2009 technically it was the the kickoff but you're still kind of doing both for a bit exactly you've really done your research <laughs> thank I, you i told you um true so you know this whole time after after closing you that's uh, after closing flavor hall i was really kind of still in the back of my mind thinking like what is the business around the mind like how is it that i can use the knowledge and experience that i've gained and how the brain works to really help people in some way and i kept going back to my time in the lab working with steve and thinking like there's really something there we're like literally letting people yeah. interact with the world directly with their brain like and i really think i can form a business around it and we, you know, would sort of play around with it. And then I went to, I approached Chris and James Fung at the time, who was working with us early on, and said, can we really make this real? Can we, can we do something here? And I brought on a friend of mine, Trevor Coleman, who was my boyfriend. So my boyfriend was uh, Chris DeCastro, not Chris Amini. Chris DeCastro is now my husband. But my husband's best friend at the time was a guy called Trevor Coleman, who was really into uh, music promotion and artist management and creating experiences that were awesome and taking like, you know, dive bars and turning them around and making them a place where everybody wanted to be. He just had a great sense of business and what makes a great experience for people. So I brought in Trevor and Chris and myself and the three of us kind of sat down and said, okay, we're going to form a business around this what is it going to be and this is sort of like more 2005 six, seven, like before we really formalize it and by 2009 we are formalized as muse we've spent or interacts on we've spent uh you know many many hours sitting in trevor's basement literally he had a basement apartment and we would sit around coming up with business plans for business that didn't exist and initially thought that we were going to be creating experiences for the clubs that he was promoting at and that that was going to be this. Um, and so we said, well, what's the biggest experience we could create for people that would really show people the power of their mind? And now this is 2009 and the Olympics are coming to Canada the next year. Do you remember Toronto's in Canada and in 2010 we hosted the Winter Olympics with no controversy, which seems really hard to do these days. Um, and we put together a proposal that suggested we could control the lights on Olympic rings with people's brains because along the way we had done a series of explorations of how you could use this technology in various ways, sound, light, physical objects, etc. And along the same time, we were picked out by somebody for uh, the Governor General's um, Innovation Award, like the Premier's Innovation Award. And uh, so we ended up doing an experience at the Premier's Innovations Awards for the government. And I said, hey, do you guys know anybody in the Olympics secretariat, like, you know, responsible for the Olympics? And so they put me in contact with the Ontario branch that was responsible for the development of the Olympics in Canada, which is going to be in Vancouver, which is far away for those who don't know. Different mm -hmm. state. We call them provinces. Yeah, yes, yes, a bit, yeah. Um, and so we started to develop this project with them that involved controlling the lights on the CN Tower, the Canadian Park Buildings, and Niagara Falls with people's minds from across the country. So we ended up in Vancouver. Um, we, we literally, you know, uh, had taken this crazy technology and under a very short time frame had to create an extraordinary experience that was meant to represent the innovation in Canada at the Olympics. And so we uh, created this experience that allowed people to control the lights on these massive icons with their brain from across the country. And it was a resounding success. You know, we managed to both overcome the technological hurdles, which were significant, as well as the kind of human experience side of it. You know, making something that was fun to use, that was seamless, that was interactive, that worked across multiple languages, or if you, you know, could figure out what to do even if you didn't speak English, that was intuitive. And um, from there, you know, at the end of the Olympics, it was kind of like we were on top of the world. You know, we, we, we had pulled this off. Yeah, of we, course. Yeah, we've done this, and, and what's next? And that's, you know, maybe when the next period of disappointment set in, it's like, okay, great. 
We control the lights on the CN Tower with people's brains. But so what? It's like, what, right. what, like, what do you really and do And how are we going to make money? Yeah. And so um, less how are we going to make money, although that was an incredibly important sure. question. Um, but also how are we going to build value from this? Yeah, sure. You know, there's uh, standing at the base of this CN Tower in the freezing cold in Canada and changing the lights on it is not actually building value for anybody. <laughs> um, and so we spent a long time experimenting with the tech, like banging our head against the wall saying, how do we, how do we really build something that creates value with this technology? Because we know it's there. And that's where we did all our fun things like thought controlled beer tap, um, which by the way, when you have seven beers, no longer works. So it is a self-limiting system. Exactly. So there, you know, is exactly there is some social value there. <laughs> I was like, this has to, there has to be a point where the brain's like, yeah. uh, more. And it's like almost like self-regulated. And there's some totally. part of your brain that's still like, not more. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, easiest way to get yourself cut off. <laughs> you just, that's you right. can't, you can't pour your own beer anymore. Um, and it. we had some pretty awesome Christmas parties with it. Um, but you know, it wasn't delivering tangible value to humanity um and we we did all sorts of fun things and slot controlled thought controlled slot car machines and we explored you know how we create responsive rooms and kept finding ways to allow the brain to control technology and through that process realized that what we were doing that was so powerful was not actually you know making a light bulb get brighter or a sound go dimmer what we were actually doing was giving people feedback on their own mental process, on their own brain's process. And that the real value here was not actually controlling technology outside of you with your brain. The real value was using this technology to help you control your own mind, to help you gain insight into your own mental state and then shift and change that with feedback. So, you know, as we're telling people to focus to make the light brighter, or relax to make the light dimmer, we were actually telling them to focus and relax and they were focusing and seeing the value of it and then becoming reinforced to it. It's neurofeedback right. or relaxing and then getting the subconscious signal to their brain that actually, you know, this, you are relaxing, this is working, do more of that, do more of that. And then letting people see the readout on their brain activity. And what we recognized is that was the real value. And then we needed to apply that in a way that was going to be tangible. And right at this point, right now we're like 2011, 2012, we went to a conference in San Francisco that was on the Google campus um, that was uh, called Wisdom 2.0. And it was about the integration of technology and wisdom practices, meditation. And uh, were while you already we were... into meditation at this point? Were you already, is this already something that you had prioritized? Yeah. So at that point, we could see that there was this link between what we were teaching people in meditation. So Trevor was actually a practicing Buddhist. Um, myself, I was a terrible meditator, but as a psychotherapist, meditation is a frontline approach that you use for trauma, anxiety, right. depression, etc. Um, and, you know, as someone trained in neuroscience, I understood the literature associated with it and the value there. And so... You know, we recognize that as we're teaching people to focus and relax, we're actually kind of teaching them to meditate. And that meditation is something that is so incredibly valuable for people, but quite difficult to do um, and much less popular back in 2012. Yeah. And that if we could build a tool that was actually going to make meditation easier for people, then we would bring real value to this world. You know, the value wasn't controlling lights in a flashing building. The value is really teaching people to manage themselves and to be able to self-regulate. And even if the technology didn't work, even if we got just, you know, 10 more people to meditate in this world, we would have done something good. Now, it turns right. out the technology really did work. And since then, you know, almost half a million people have learned to meditate with Muse or deepen their practice with it. But at that time, it was just like, okay, if we can just get more people to meditate, you know, if, if this just works, then, then this is the thing. And so we went to this conference um, it was, you know, as part of, it was like this first or second Wisdom 2.0. Um, and it was really the beginning of this conversation about bringing, um, uh, technology into mindfulness. And we met a guy named Chad Mantang. He was, one second, responsible for Google's meditation program back in 2012. And he became our first investor. 
He brought us into a little room. We pitched him. He said, you know, if this technology does what I think it does, um, you're going to help me on my mission. This is Meng's mission of, uh, of bringing in world peace within my lifetime. And I'm writing you a check for $100,000. <laughs> and we all just sort of like looked at each other yeah, okay, okay. Like, here we go okay here we go i guess we're building a meditation tool and so we then went and set about really building our meditation tool and taking it into vc's offices and we'd show them the technology and they'd be like oh my god this is incredible it can do all these things what's the killer app and we'd be like meditation and they'd literally laugh us out of the office <laughs> right like, now, okay i get it now what yeah yeah, they're like, meditation, really? That's the killer app? Like, that's a big market for you? And it turns out, 12 years later, meditation sure. truly was the killer app. Um, and many of those VCs meditate with Muse. Um, and it was this fascinating process of, you know, building a thing that was definitely before its time. Um, and, you know, sometimes people would be like, what are you building? We're like, oh, it's a cognitive trainer. And we had like, you know, logos of like brains with with muscles on them um and sometimes they'd be like is this like meditation it would be like do you meditate and they'd be like yes and we're like yeah it's meditation but shh <laughs> right right <laughs> and then uh 2013 meditation was on the cover of time magazine and like that sort of began the the inflection point in meditation being everywhere and meditation being a thing that you know big ceos are doing and athletes are doing and celebrities are doing and we managed to just be in the right place at the right time with the solution that actually made meditation easier, that actually solved that problem that most people have when you meditate of like, what's going on in my mind? Am I doing this right? And with Muse, we're able to give people real-time feedback on their brain to say, yes, you're doing it right. You are meditating. That's exactly what you should be doing. Or nope, your mind is wandering. Come on back, back to your focus. And so- okay, Can you talk a little bit, little bit about it just for like, like when, it, when you describe it to like the lay person, you know, again, and you think about all this, you know, again, someone who's using it, you know, your typical meditation app and they're struggling. How does, you know, how does the fact that, again, this is kind of hooking into your brain ways, how does it work in terms of helping people to return back to that, that laser focus? Because I think that's what happens, right? With most people is they, they understand the benefits, maybe appreciate it. And they've tried it one, two, three, four, five, six, seven times. And they just aren't able to get there. And so the, the tech itself, like, how, you know, what was so revolutionary about the tech to kind of keep the people focused? Sure. So what Muse is, it's a slim little headband that rests on your forehead. So in the same way that you'd have a Fitbit on your wrist, this is a Muse band on your head. And it has EEG sensors that detect uh, changes in your brain activity. And specifically, it's able to let you know when you're focused in meditation and when your mind is wandering. And it does that with an audio landscape. So the metaphor we use is your mind is like the weather. So when you're thinking, distracted, your mind wandering, you hear it as stormy. And when you come to quiet, focused attention on your breath, the storm quiets and little birds chirp telling you, yes, you're doing it right, you're doing it right. And so what it does is it really makes the process of meditation crystal clear. So for people who don't know what meditation is and they're like is my mind just supposed to go blank um it's like right. no it's okay your mind's not supposed to go blank you're doing the right thing you're like you're in the zone this is it yep you got it and for people who have an existing meditation practice this becomes a way to very quickly identify when your mind is wandering and you're in thoughts become much better at being able to have metacognition observing your thoughts and becoming much faster at returning back to your breath and staying there so it really is like like a mirror for your meditation practice or like a little coach inside your head saying, yep, you're doing it right. Um, and really either teaching you what to do for the first time or really deepening and accelerating your learning. Okay, great. Yeah, and I think, and then obviously now you've got, you, you know, again, I don't want to fast forward too much. So let's talk about, so at like late 2010s, right? So it's, you're starting to gain traction. Things are going in. We're also at this point, you know, we're starting to see like other wearables, right? Like wearables mm -hmm. weren't really a thing, you know, until... You like Fitbit, like, you know, some other ones that had came out and, you know, as, as you're seeing these other things come out, like, how do, how did you kind of, I guess, continue to position Muse as a part of this, this process? Because obviously now there's a lot around sleep, et cetera. So I, I definitely want you to talk about, you know, with like the, the Muse S, like this gen, you know, I know there's a lot of focus around sleep as well. So like, how does, how does the, the mission evolve as, like you said, people meditation becomes, people are now used to wearing these things or rings or watches or you know other things to track their 
you know, their, their daily activities. And, you know, how do you see, how did you like view that as you were, you know, kind of continuing to develop and, you know, as you kind of think about the future of Muse and, and what it's doing now, obviously I think sleep has become a big priority similar to like the wave. I think you saw in meditation. I feel like we're seeing a wave in, you know, productive sleep. Right. So again, I think, you know, how has that, how has that evolved over time, you know, and started to lead into these other areas. So on the wearables question, you know, we, we were extremely lucky that there was another trend that was building exactly at that time of, you know, the early jawbone ups and Fitbits and blood pressure cuffs. And so you had all of these wearables that could track different parts of your body, but nothing that worked for the brain. So we were able to really fit nicely into a new category that people were understanding and that was emerging wearables and fit in this very unique niche of it where there wasn't somebody else operating. And um, we knew we, you know, that the meditation tool was the thing that we cared deeply about, and that was the product that we went to market with. And as it began to grow and build traction, and we, you know, would get emails back saying like, oh my God, I can finally meditate, you know, I've been trying to, <laughs> I've always tried to learn how to meditate and like, finally I can do it. And then, you know, seeing the results like, oh, you yeah. know, I'm, I'm, my husband's going through cancer care and. I'm finding I'm nicer to him and to my kids because I'm now meditating with Muse. Like that was like the second Amazon review we got. I was like, oh my God, That's we're amazing. actually having an impact. Yes. Yeah. Um, you know, now we're, there's hundreds of thousands of users. And when we went back and surveyed them and said, what are the times when you're using your device and what are the use cases? It turns out that the two most popular times to meditate were uh, 7 a.m. followed closely by 6 a.m. Yeah, right, right before. Yep. Yeah, right, the right, early, right, early meditators. Right, right when you wake up. Yeah, I'm, right, I'm, I'm not in the 6 a.m. camp. <laughs> yeah. um, and then the second most popular time was 10 p.m. And people were actually using their muse to help them fall asleep. Because they do a meditation right before bed. It would teach them to shut down their mind. Because why do most people have difficulty falling asleep? Because your mind just won't stop. So this would teach them to quiet their mind. And they could fall into sleep. And we recognized that we could build something that would actually work much better for that. And so we created a new device called Muse S, which was soft and comfy that you could actually wear to sleep so that you could continue to wear the Muse device while you were falling asleep. And then as it turns out, once you have a clinical grade EEG on your head, so Muse is a clinical grade EEG, there's literally hundreds and hundreds of papers by awesome research labs using Muse. Once you have an EEG on your head, you can track sleep basically as effectively as a sleep lab. So now we have this device that people have in their homes and have in their beds which is able to track their sleep moment by moment stage by stage as effectively as a massive sleep lab with all of those wires and goop and you know an awful yeah. environment and so we recognize that like this is incredibly powerful it's super powerful both for the research world and we now have a lot of researchers who are running sleep studies using Muse in ways that you couldn't have done before because you can't bring hundreds of people into a sleep lab easily and we can give consumers insights really really detailed insights into their sleep but that was kind of not good enough for us because like I, I see I'm sleeping poorly how is this helpful right and like, so, yeah I know it sucks yeah. I feel like crap right <laughs> thank you <laughs> um, and it is helpful because, you know, we can just show you like literally the depth of your deep sleep. You know, there's there's lots you can learn from it. Um, but what we really cared about was the intervention side, getting people to actually sleep better as a result of it. And so we this is really Chris's genius. Chris, Steve Mann's old student, my dear friend who is the business partner and really like the, the the technical and spiritual genius behind Muse. So together we created this experience where as you're falling asleep, you're listening to beautiful guided content, which helps you quiet your mind. And then the content starts to shift and change as you move out of wakefulness in order to cue your brain that it's time to sleep. And once you're asleep, the content shuts off. And then if you wake up in the middle of the night, the muse wakes up with you and uh, brings back in the same beautiful experience that helped you fall asleep in the first place to help you easily fall back asleep. And so we've been working on this uh, sleep technology for quite some time. It just came out earlier this year. And there was a recent study that demonstrated that using the Muse to help you fall asleep and go back to sleep improves uh, sleep quality by 20%, which is a dramatic margin. And so, you know, we're now incredibly passionate about the ways that you can 
both improve your emotional and your cognitive abilities in the daytime by, yes, meditating and sleeping better at night. That's awesome. I mean, yeah, and again, like, I think, I'm, I, again, as I, I'm, like, thinking about this myself, I'm like, yes, like, this is, this is it. Because I think a lot of people can relate to that, you know, that ability to shut down, right? If you look at what's happening, there's the amount that people are working now and, you know, the different stresses that we have and, you know, because of COVID and because of being locked up for so long and because of kids being around and all these things, I think it's that, that re-waking up too, that I think you call it like the digital sleeping pill, right? Isn't yeah. that the... Yes. Yeah, which I love, um, which, is, which is great. So we're, we'll link to this. And again, I, I really encourage everyone to go check out Muse and, and what you, know, you all are up to and how the, you know, the product continues to evolve. What, what's the next? I mean, obviously, this is a big leap. You know, th this, this is obviously has been a big push. And obviously, you know, your passion for meditation and seeing the impact across you know, your customers and uh, customers, customers, et cetera. How, you know, how do you, like, where does this go from here? You know, like, as you think about Muse and your next you know, kind of evolution or like where you want to get it? Like, what are some things that you're excited about? Sure. So for us, the next evolution is really pairing these, this intervention of meditation and sleep with outcomes in people's lives. So for example, we built this really beautiful pain course with an expert in pain and meditation, Dr. Ron Siegel at Harvard, and it applies the tools and techniques of meditation to helping you live more effectively and manage your pain. Um, and so, you know, we're, we're really interested in not just how you get somebody to start a meditation practice and, you know, maintain their practice, but right. how you really get people to um, make the, the habit changes and have the support tools around them to really make life shifts in things that you want to shift in your life, whether it's sleep or eating or pain or anxiety you know we want to we've been creating sets of tools for people to really be able to adapt the technology to their personalized changes that's amazing and what do you i mean what how, like in the back of my mind i was thinking too it's like it's so interesting again with this world of wearables too and just the the data that you're able to track um you know how does i guess like you know again like i can imagine this for fitness too like right like if people worked out with this, just learning so much about just how their body reacts and like the brain waves that have reacted. Like, have you guys done any work around like fitness in those categories? I know that you have like a lot of athletes that use it on the meditation and, and sleep side. Yeah. Um, but it, are there fitness applications too, to this? Or, so, you know, so we, yeah. yeah, we do have a ton of athletes that use this, like gold medal athletes, yeah. NFL winning Super Bowl, you know, Super Bowl winning NFL team players, um, uh, like, lots of NBA players. There's a ton of athletes that have been using Muse. And so it's less something that you use during your athletic performance. It's something that you use beforehand to get yourself into a state of yeah. focus, to quiet your anxiety, to be able to let go of the crowd, let go of the sensation of pressures to, you know, let those move by you. Um, and then something that you use afterwards is recovery during sleep. Love that. Yeah. And, and what do you, and again, that, that makes a ton of sense to me. And so as, as we start to kind of wrap up here, you know, as you talk about like pain management, like what are, what are, I guess, what are some of the other, I guess, if maybe not, you know, during, you know, what are some of the, I guess, the additional, so we talked about pain, are there additional applications and, you know, will, will you ever go back to trying to, you know, I always think too, I'm like, wow, you're so close. Like, like, like thinking about controlling things with your, your brain as well, too. And obviously, you, that was the old version, etc. You know, like, what are the things that maybe that you're seeing and whether it's with Muse or just in the ether right now that, again, you were doing things so far ahead of your time, you know, 10 years ago, and then even 20 years ago, some of the early stuff, like, are there additional applications for this, whether it's with Muse or with just other brainwave technologies you're seeing that I, I, I think are exciting or, or interesting for people to learn? Sure. Um, and we're not going to go back to controlling technology with your mind because that's not actually that interesting to me. <laughs> really, what's interesting is helping to evolve humans to become better versions of ourselves. You know, to me, that's how you that's how you deal with the wars and the strife in this world. You evolve better humans. Um, and so we, you know, for us on the content side, we have a subscription that has a ton of content that helps you use Muse for relationship troubles, you know, for uh, be going through the stress of college, for feeling insecure, like all of these really human experiences that we have. You know, yeah. we have content and programs to, 
to help you work through it, like the difficulties, the practical and tangible difficulties in our lives. And then on the sort of further outside, on the research side, there's uh, lots of researchers who've used Muse in really fascinating ways. So um, one group out of Baycrest Hospital was able to track um, mild cognitive decline in the elderly using Muse looking at brain signals. Um, two other totally separate labs um, did experiments, not just experiments, they did interventions in um, emergency rooms and were able to track stroke as effectively as an MRI or a CAT scan just using the Muse in three minutes. Um, the Mayo Clinic is using Muse in a wide variety of ways. So they published a paper with breast cancer patients awaiting surgery, demonstrating that improved their quality of life. They now oh, that's awesome. have, their, yeah, have their frontline doctors in the ER during COVID using Muse to deal with burnout. Um, and for us, you know, we're really interested in the particularities of the brain and new information and insights that we can give you. Um, you know, we've been able to do things like track changes in brain age decade by decade that haven't been seen in the literature before. Um, so, you know, we're, we're fascinated by the kinds of insights that we can give you on your own mind. It's awesome. Yeah, that's great. So I am going to be a new Muse as Gen 2 customer. I'm telling you right now, you've heard it here first. Um, I think that this is amazing. You know, this idea of, again, I think we're, we're so focused on those, the intense moments and did I get max recovery for my, you know, next workout, the reality is what, you know, what, what most likely many of us need is, is a way to, to turn off and not and focus on how to not be intense and how to, you know, take those pauses or those recharges that we need versus the, you know, how can I maximize my recovery time so I can work out today? Um, which don't get me wrong, there's a lot of value there as well too. But, um, but I think it's really, it's really interesting. And I think, you know, people hearing your story just about how you followed your passions and how, you know, you've now turned a passion into something that's impacting so many people's lives and how you've really kind of marched to the beat of your own drum to find this amazing opportunity. And, and also, I think your your story of entrepreneurship, you know, for the last decade, you know, it's like it's this thing and now it's this thing and then it's this thing and that, you know, being successful and you know being a successful entrepreneur takes time. And sometimes it takes doing this business and that business and this and this and and, you know, if it's something that you're passionate about, you tend to find a way, you know, you kind of find the path to where the, the passion aligns and the business. And it sounds like, you know, there's going to be some really cool things that you are continued to work on. So excited to watch it. And like I said, we'll make sure to link to everything in the show so everyone can go check it out, too. Thank you so much. Yeah, there's been a lot of twists and turns. And when you look back, it all makes perfect sense. Um, and at the time, it's just all experiments and exploration and, and figuring out what works and when it doesn't, pivoting and not, not being upset about it, just figuring out, okay, if that didn't work, then what, what is going to work? What is going to provide value? What is going to be, you know, this fascinating thing? Such a good perspective. You know, I feel like sometimes people, yeah, it's like, gosh, we, we forget that the, 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 the journey is the journey. You know, the journey is the thing, and as opposed to like, well, what am I going to get out of this? And how do I know? It's like, well, you don't. Like, you don't. Like, you don't, and you never will. So, <laughs> give it a hundred percent and do your best. And then, if you want to pivot, pivot. It's all good. Like, let go. So, I love it. So, Ariel, thank you so much for joining me today. I, I really enjoyed it. I think our listeners will as well too. Ah, uh, it was so much fun. Thank you so much. All right, amazing. And everyone, as usual, we'll see you next week on the Jake Donlap Show. All right. Thank you so much, everyone, for tuning in to another extremely fun and interesting episode. I thought it was fun and interesting, so I hope you did too, of the Jake Dunlap Show. Uh, really great just breaking down everything that makes people who they are, the success, the trials and errors, and I hope that you enjoyed it as much as I did. Make sure to subscribe on your favorite platform and make sure more than anything to go over to jakedunlap.com. That's where you're going to stay up to date on all the latest guests, additional details, prep notes. We're going to be sharing everything on jakedunlap.com. So go ahead, go over there. You can subscribe there as well too. And we will see you next week on the Jake Dunlap Show.